Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations with artists, writers, and curators. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 96. Today's guest is Helen Zaltzman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today's guest is podcaster Helen Zaltzman. If, like me, you find language and its uses and intersections with culture to be endlessly fascinating, you probably already know about Helen's show, The Allusionist, which she has hosted since 2015. Or you might know her from her other show, her original show, Answer Me This, in which she and her co-host, Ali Mann, answer listener questions on everything from etymology to etiquette to microwavable eggs Benedict to the monkeys of Gibraltar. That show has been going since 2007. Or if you're a Veronica Mars superfan, perhaps you've already found her latest show, Veronica Mars Investigations, an episode-by-episode dive into Veronica Mars, which just started in August. Or maybe, just maybe, you are brand new to the Helen Zaltzman oeuvre, in which case, let me tell you, you're in for a treat. My personal favorite of Helen's shows is The Allusionist, which I've been listening to for years now. She has this way of talking about language in ways that are unexpected and very entertaining, often very funny. But also, many of the topics she talks about are actually kind of a big deal. This year, for example, she did an episode about the history of Polari, which is a code language that was used by gay men in the 1950s as a way of identifying and communicating with each other in a way that helped keep them hidden and therefore safe from those who might otherwise want to do them harm. And one of my favorite episodes from 2018 was a two-episode series on language suppression in the UK. The arc was called Survival. It's all just so interesting and so well-crafted, so I was pleased to get the chance to talk with Helen about her work. Now, for those of you in the London area, this coming weekend, Helen will have three live events she's appearing at as part of the London Podcast Festival. On Saturday, September 14th, 2019, at 12.30 p.m., she'll be doing a guest appearance at a live recording of the 90 Minutes or Less Film Festival podcast. Then on Sunday, September 15th, at 4.30 p.m., she'll be doing a live recording of the Fear podcast with Sarah Morgan. And if that weren't enough, in between those, on Saturday the 14th at 4.30 p.m., she'll be kicking off her new Allusionist Live show, which is titled No Title. And she'll be touring that show all over the U.S. subsequently. You can find all of the cities and dates of that tour on the Allusionist website at theallusionist.org slash events, and there's a link in the show notes for that. All right, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Helen Zaltzman. So how are you today? Pretty well, thank you, Mike. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing all right. You know, before I say anything else, I did just want to say that I really, really enjoy The Illusionist a lot. I think I've been listening for a couple of years now, um, ever since it got mentioned on Pop Culture Happy Hour, I think. And it's really just a, a highlight of my fortnight, Aww. I guess. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to, I wanted to start out with what might be kind of a most banal possible question. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's and, about my level. And hopefully it will wind up being less silly than that. But anyway, I guess sort of the question I wanted to start with was why language? Like, what is it about language that draws you in? I know that you, you know, reading other interviews and listening to other uh, interview podcasts that you've done. This has been a fascination of yours for a long time. And I'm uh, yeah. just kind of curious to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I think my fascination certainly shifted when I started doing The Illusionist because the things that I'm drawn to in the making of it and not necessarily what I would even have imagined before I began. But I think the fundamental interest in language that I have and that a lot of other people have is that it's this tool we pretty much every human alive has to use in some form. And we learn it when we're very young and we're very good at using it without thinking about it too much, but it's a very complicated thing. And also the rules of it aren't real rules. They're not concrete rules. It's, it's a tacit agreement between people that something means what it means and that you communicate in this mutually intelligible way. You know, that, that agreement shifts all the time. So between the enormity of language and, and the fact that it's to do with every person and different with every person, and then the constantly changing nature of it. I mean, there's a lot to <laughs> wrap your brain around. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that it's, it's so interesting 
you know, I'm sure that this is something uh, being on Twitter uh, at all, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, both of us are on Twitter, I think, a fair amount. We but, are. And maybe this is not necessarily a new thing, but at, uh, certainly on Twitter, language is such a a center of these sort of ideological battles that we have. People seem to get very invested in these <laughs> rules. You know what I mean? Mm. Well, I think when you're little and you're acquiring language and a lot of things, you're taught rules and you think, okay, well, that's that's all there is to it. And then the more you experience, the more you, <laughs> you find things don't fit those rules. And that can be very frustrating, especially if you're not taught that the rules aren't real rules, which, which I wasn't. I was taught very little about language itself and had to kind of figure it out. So people are very insistent, but also it, it took me a long time to realize just how much prejudice there is wired in based on things like geography, social class, uh, race and correcting people's language can be a, a really cruel thing to do and a, an, a, an oppressive thing to do. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. Yeah, that's actually one thing that I, I wanted to talk a little bit about because I feel like the illusionist has what I would call sort of a progressive sensibility. You know, most of the linguists that I know, I have a few friends that are editors or linguists or lexicographers, and they all tend to have a very uh, sort of looser or more what they call descriptivist approach to language. What's interesting to me about a lot of the episodes that have really stuck with me with The Illusionist have been ones that sort of take on these ideas of how language and society intersect. You've done a number of episodes that are uh, about language and the LGBTQ plus community and inclusivity around those things. You've done episodes around language suppression um, and different cultural things. I think that how language is such a site of identity is a really interesting thing. And the fact that you are really directly talking about these things in your show it feels like a it's different from what I have seen in other sort of language media before. Uh, and hmm. I, I find that really interesting. It wasn't what I expected of myself either, but I feel like I have to be particularly careful because um, I'm an, a native English speaker and English has really done a number <laughs> on uh, an awful lot of places in the world. I, I think English is an endlessly fascinating language, but the the more you learn about it, the more problematic it can seem because, you know, it's, it's all tied up in colonialization and, and globalization and stuff like that. But, uh, for instance, I was in Australia recently and, um, before English arrived, there were at least 250 native languages in Australia. And then the first nations people were genocided. The horrific things happened. Uh, you know, the, the family generations were separated. They were removed from their land. And if there was forced into breeding in order to uh, dilute and dissipate the uh, First Nations culture. And so you could get into huge trouble for speaking your own language, which is a, a pattern that is not uncommon. And so you lose so much when English comes in and dominates in, in that suppressive way. It is very useful as well to have a, a language that is globally used. Um, but, you know, there are downsides. And even within... Britain, which is a small place. It's a very linguistically diverse place for one so small. And um, I'm from the southeast of England and southeastern English kind of oppressed a lot of other forms of English within just Britain and also regional languages. So like Welsh nearly died out. Um, it was subject to a successful revival 50 years ago that started, but it, it was a concerted effort. And in Scotland, Scots, I, I, I knew very little about this. And I, um, I had a friend on my show last year who's a Scots language campaigner. And um, she was just talking about the shame that's kind of wired in when people have this language that they grow up speaking at home, but they know they can't speak it outside the home. In people who were my age were beaten at school for speaking Scots. So then they might just stop speaking it at all, or they have this pain associated with it and not necessarily even realize that they have this language. They might 
think it's only their family slang rather than a thing that is more widespread in in their culture and what what culturally that reflects so i feel that you know i i didn't choose where i was born and where i grew up and how i speak is reflective of my upbringing and it feels a bit pretentious to <laughs> to change it um but I do feel very conscious that I'm kind of a representative of the linguistic oppressors and therefore I have to tread very carefully and not try to enact that further and not try to reflect that. Um, but I'm trying to do this in the format of an entertainment show. <laughs> so, <laughs> combining those elements of like talking about genocide and oppression um, in a 20 minute bit of entertainment um, is uh, an interesting exercise, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily go looking for these stories. I wasn't necessarily being that open eyed at all. And yet once you find them, I felt like I couldn't ignore them. I think it's interesting because, you know, it's such a common story. That episode that you did last year about the Scots language was one of my favorites. And one of the things that I found so interesting about it is that it's not, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound insensitive, but it's not usually the kind of story that one associates, or at least an American wouldn't associate with white people. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Where, you know, here it might be whether it's indigenous languages, um, you know, uh, uh, American Indian languages or say the native Hawaiian uh, mm. language revitalization program um, or around the world. Like I know that there's uh, been a successful Maori language program yeah. in New Zealand, but the way the stories of, you know, that kind of d oppression very literally happening within our lifetimes, the stories that these people tell, the stories that people were telling in that episode are very similar to the ones that you hear, for example, um, Native Americans talking about. And I found that really fascinating. It seems like it's the kind of thing that um, provides this opportunity for people to find out what they have in common, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I, there's something really... I don't want to say nice about it because it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the worst. But the, the, this other thing that you were saying about, you know, it needing to be entertaining, I, I find that your show strikes this really nice and interesting balance in tone uh, where I feel like, you know, for example, I, I used to listen to other radio shows or podcasts that are about language. I feel like a lot of them feel, even though they might be interesting, they often feel sort of like you're in school. Mm, yes, uh, and uh, I don't really listen to them. <laughs> mm. Also, because I don't want to plagiarize other people's work. And when I hear things, I'm more likely to forget where I acquired that knowledge from, because it goes straight into my brain. Whereas when I read it, I'll be like, oh, okay, I can attribute it to that person. Sure. But, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't want to cover things that I know that they've covered. So it's best just to stay out of it. But also a lot of them are a bit uh, dry and bossy. Yeah. Is that unfair? Yeah, I'm, I don't know, you know, some of them are, I mean, even the ones that are maybe more friendly still sort of feel like public radio, um, <laughs> which, you know, I'm fine with that. I listen to public radio, <laughs> um, but I, you know, taking a show like yours and especially, you know, a host like you where you have a lot of experience doing a comedy podcast, uh, you know, you've been doing Answer Me This for uh, quite a long time now. Yeah, nine million years. <laughs> Um, I don't know. There, there's something I, I wonder sort of like whether maybe that tone that you have that is, you know, at times very warm or at times funny or, you know, diff it's a different sort of different approach might maybe help that message go down a little easier. I do think because the show tends to be quite light and informative that when something more difficult or more complicated comes along, people are already open to accepting it because uh, I've Trojan horsed them <laughs> with, with the other content or they're just not expecting it or they might not go to a show specifically to hear about, for instance, trans people's experiences. But if I put them on my show, they'll find themselves listening to them and then they'll be like, oh, wow, I had no idea and I should have paid attention to this. And so it's a privilege for me to have this kind of access to people's brains and a platform and it's exciting to get to use it. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your process. Mm. I wonder what my process is. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered. Well, I mean, so uh, I read uh, this interview that you did for the uh, PRX Medium page. 
Mm. And, uh, you know, there were a bunch of things in there that I found really interesting. One of them was you were just describing a trip that you just sort of took by happenstance while you were in Argentina. And then that was what led to the second home episode. Yes, which was about Welsh language oppression. Right. So I, I guess I was, one of the things that I was wondering is, you know, broadly how you kind of come up with what you were going to do on each episode, but I, more specifically, how much sort of accident or discovery or things like that are involved with your process around the show? Accident is uh, some of my favorite. I love things that I wasn't looking for. But also I tend not to be interested in pursuing episodes where I know that much about it. If if something piques my curiosity, I think, oh, great. Okay, that's something to pursue. But if I think I could see the end already, then I'm just not that bothered. So I'm educating myself whilst I make the show. And uh, serendipity is marvelous. And often I'll interview someone about something and then realize that the angle of the show based on what they said, is uh, completely different. So I like to go into an interview prepared enough that it feels respectful to the interviewee because they're giving me their time and their expertise. But I like the freedom for it to go into all sorts of places and not just be me chasing down some things that I've predetermined that I want the show to be about. I mean, I think, you know, that's that's something that I think a lot about for this show as well. Um, I like to leave a lot of room for sort of discovery and just for things to happen. And I'm wondering a little bit about, uh, you know, we mentioned Answer Me This. The format of Answer Me This is very different from The Illusionist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that more goes into it than what the layperson might imagine. In the, I mean, obviously you're doing research to answer the questions, but even aside from that, just in the production of the episodes, things are never as, as uh, uh, it's, everybody has this idea, I think, that you just sort of hit record and that's it. <laughs> Oh, if only. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's something about um, Answer Me This that, I mean, it does feel uh, very in the moment, and I'm sure that there is production and editing and stuff like that it happens, but it does seem that a lot of what goes into that show is sort of what happens on that day. Um, hmm. And and I guess, uh, you know, so I'm wondering how much maybe, you know, the process of doing one might inform the process of doing the other or the other way around, things like that. Well, answer me this. When I started it, I had no idea what I was doing. I hadn't worked in audio production before. And uh, the only relevant experience I had was talking. And I hadn't run a website before. I'd never edited audio, which is now what I spend most of my time doing. And so um, we had to teach ourselves all of that. Because when we started answer me this, there wasn't that much guidance about podcasting around, which was a relief because I couldn't stress myself out with all the things I didn't know, because I didn't know I didn't know them. So we just did what seemed sensible and straightforward. And we thought at the beginning, no one's going to want to listen to us because we're nobodies. So let's edit the show, make sure it's tight, not wasting people's time because they're, they're competing with the whole internet for entertainment. And now it feels like you're competing with a lot of other podcasts for people's ear time in a way that you weren't in 2007. But it's still the case, you know, if people aren't enjoying a podcast, you've got like, 20, 30 seconds to capture someone's attention. And if they're not into it, then they're gone forever. So we thought we've got to try and get them within 30 seconds. But also the editing was quite freeing because we could go off on tangents and if they didn't work, it really didn't matter. And sometimes they did work and, and that was great. And um, so I still find that. I, I think editing is a very, very creative process and very underrated in that way. I find that that's where the shape of my work really takes place is afterwards particularly because for a long time I didn't feel like I had that much control during recordings, but I did know that I had control after. So with Answer Me This, we spend, it's, it, we take questions from the audience. Uh, so we spend a few hours going through our emails and voice messages, and then we figure out which questions we'd like to answer that we haven't covered before and that are on topics we haven't covered really recently. And there's a good variety in the show. And then we split them up into who's going to research what, and spend a few hours on research and we record for an hour and a half to two hours. But then there's two full working days of editing per show. I do an edit, Ollie, my co-host, then listens to it. He makes a bunch of notes. Then I do a second edit. So it's a highly polished turd. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think people do think we just switch the mics on and we have an orchestra doing our jingles live each time. Um, <laughs> but 
yeah, the, my work tends to be very heavily loaded towards post-production. Mm. So capture something spontaneous in the moment and then take out the stuff that wasn't good around it. Yeah. Is the plan. <laughs> I but I used to be a book editor before as an audio editor. So oh. I think I was already attuned to the idea of removing stuff to make something the best version of itself. And I find that a lot easier than the creation of the material. Well, not easy. No, it's very challenging, but it's useful for me to know during the creation of the material that I'm going to make it better afterwards. Yeah. I hadn't ever really thought about editing as a, I guess the site of creative work, even though hearing you say that it makes a lot of sense. Another thing that you mentioned in that PRX piece was that um, something you wish you had known um, on episode one that you <laughs> after a hundred episodes, you know, is that it's a writing job, not an audio job. Yeah. What a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I hate writing. Hate it. I think everybody hates writing and likes having written. Certainly that's how I feel. <laughs> I don't even like having written because then I just feel disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you've done a fair amount of writing for someone who, who hates writing. You have done a fair amount of writing. You've written for radio and for television. You've written for newspapers and magazines. And obviously you write for the illusionist. And I guess I, I was wondering, like, do they feel very different to you or the, is there something that feels in common and, and whether or not writing for different media like that, what, how they inform each other perhaps? Hmm. Well, writing for TV, I did the kind of job where, uh, often on shows where they don't have writers credited because they want it to seem like the remarks that the celebrities on a kind of comedy panel show or talk show are making those remarks off the cuff. Hmm. And what you have to do is just write dozens of potential jokes for people to say in a variety of situations. And some of them might get used. So often, I really didn't care. <laughs> well, it was a lovely job and I wanted to do it well, but it is just quite liberating knowing that it's not something that, you know, is, is probably going to be read out at my funeral. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's not going to be career defining. It's, it's to give the people who are frontline in on camera options and no need to get too precious about it. And, and also just churn them out and then recognize which ones are good. And then maybe write more that are good. It's, it's, it makes the process seem very banal, <laughs> but that's it. Um, and when I was writing articles, I was a book reviewer for a long time and I probably shouldn't have been. I kind of regret it because, <laughs> um, it's much harder to write a book, even a terrible book than it is to critique a book. And, um, now as the creator of, uh, work, I feel very guilty about what I did to other creators of work. Mm. Um, but there I felt like, it, again, what I was trying to indicate was just to the reader whether or not they should buy that book. It was a pretty short book review slot. So you had like 130 words per book. So you could basically do a sentence introducing what the book's about, a sentence about whether it's good and, and a sentence in between about, um, you know, whether the, the, whether there's something that they should recognize, like the writer did something before or, um, or, this book is about a particular thing, why it's relevant to now. And, um, and so again, it felt like a practical job, but it's almost like writing marketing blurbs, hmm. uh, which is something I find very hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> the illusionist is a very, I mean, I'm setting all the rules in the illusionist, which is why it's so galling that I made this writing job, but it was just after about a year of doing it. I thought, okay, well you have to write this bit of it anyway. So write it in a more interesting way. <laughs> what can you do with it? And then sometimes, I don't know whether you can hear us or not, but um, I'm always running incredibly late with every episode because uh, it's a solo operation and um, there's a lot of jobs and the scripting happens fairly late. And if you hear me asking rhetorical questions in the Carrie Bradshaw style, that's when I really am just <laughs> at the end of my ability to deal with the episode and I just need to get it done. Well, I mean, having a deadline, everybody, everybody who has ever worked on a deadline can certainly attest to how, how they focus you. For sure. <laughs> yes. I, I would never get anything done without the constant deadlines that I have. And I would never write for pleasure either. I have a lot of uh, respect for people who manage to sit down without a deadline or, or some kind of impetus and write stuff off their own accord. Extraordinary. Good, good for them. <laughs> I, Seriously, <laughs> I, 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 I honestly, um, you know, although I am, I consider myself a writer, I write from time to time. I, I don't think that 
writing is something that's enjoyable. I, I've never understood Mm-mm. people who say, uh, oh, I love writing, um, that they just do it for fun. For me, it's something, if I could not do it, I would not do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm great at not doing it. But I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for them that it's fun. I have a huge admiration. I wonder what that feels like. <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't find podcasting fun either. I've never found it fun. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, but it is one of those things where afterwards I am glad to have done it. Yeah. But I think it's just too much like work to be fun. It's fun going on other people's shows, but it's not fun making my own shows. Well, I mean, I think that that's an interesting thing. You know, when I think about um, this show, um, it's very meaningful to me. I enjoy the recording part of it. I enjoy the conversations, but that takes up maybe one tenth of the amount of work that I uh, right. do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the the rest of it can be a little tedious, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, t- yeah, no, you're right. I, I enjoy the people that I get to uh, talk to as a result of the show. And I enjoy a lot of the research and enjoy learning stuff. And I even enjoy a lot of the tricky bits like editing, or if I think of a fun bit of sound design to do, but overall it's still not fun, fun. Cause I think there's consequences. I find other things fun where it just doesn't matter if it fails. Mm, yeah. But this, I don't want to waste people's entertainment time. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the toll of the failure. So, um, something that we've sort of touched on a little bit, um, you mentioned, you know, back when you started answering me this, there wasn't uh, a lot of resources out there to sort of help new podcasters out. Um, uh, now obviously that's, uh, not the case. <laughs> um, but you know, one thing, another thing that's, that, that, uh, I've always been very impressed with, you run this Facebook group, um, the podcasters support group. Yes. That's very welcoming of new people. Uh, well, that's good. And, <laughs> I do wonder. Well, I mean, I, it, it seems like you wouldn't have that many people in it if, <laughs> if it weren't. <laughs> But, you know, between that, um, you know, your show has also introduced me to other shows like, you know, for example, um, when you ran an episode of um, Imaginary Advice one week. Oh, what a show. I know. It's, um, I mean, what he's doing on that show is unlike anything else I've ever heard. Yeah, Um, it's beautiful. So I was really obviously very pleased to, to, to get introduced to that. It seems to me that, you know, this sort of community aspect uh, it must be important to you because you do seem to, to spend a lot of energy on it. But I wanted to talk a little bit about that, if that's all right. Oh, absolutely. It is important to me. Yeah, you're right. It, 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 things have changed so much. And I feel like that that is one of the particularly evident things that have changed to me. But uh, I'm trying to keep it like it like it used to be. I'm not naturally a nostalgic person, but some things I want to hang on to. I mean, I, I guess one of the things, you know, even just before we um, started recording here, we were sort of talking briefly that podcasting can be sort of a, a lonely endeavor at times, um, especially for a one person operation like like your show and my show. <laughs> um, and the, there isn't necessarily going to be audience feedback in the same proportions to audience consumption. I think. I, the stat that I've read is usually it's like well, maybe one percent of people will interact at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I reckon. But you know, having um, this site to be able to connect with other people who are doing it, um, find out that we all have you know pretty similar concerns and um, things that we're thinking about. I think there's a real value in that. You know. Yeah. Well, it was years before I knew any other podcasters. I knew a few people in radio in Britain, but that was so different then. And they had jobs and they had other people telling them to make stuff. And there was a certain amount of security and regularity in that. Um, and then a few years in, I met some other people who were kind of homemade self-taught podcasters as well. And we really kind of cleaved to each other because we, we sort of really needed each other. So just often when I met another podcaster or reached out via internet going, um, oh, I'm going to be in your town. Can we meet up? They'd be like, yes. <laughs> it was, and it, you would just be on this fast track to make friends. And, um, that was r- really something I didn't know how badly I needed. Uh, and yet it doesn't seem that obscure that you would need a community <laughs> of people to, uh, <laughs> uh, generally humans, uh, uh, find the company of other humans quite nourishing, um, in a certain context. And also then, um, I remember 
about early 2014, just a lot of those friends who I have huge respect for, and some of them have been going a lot longer than me or made work a lot more challenging than mine, were getting in touch, asking if they could meet up for coffee and, and to ask me stuff about ways that they could, you know, m make money or just keep going without collapsing, that kind of thing. And I thought, well, if they're struggling with it, these people that I really hold in such high regard, then people who are much less established than us or haven't even started yet must be struggling even more. So I started having these kind of um, office hour things inspired by what Roman Mars was doing at the time. He would meet up with people with similar concerns. And very quickly, what seemed obvious was that what people were finding most valuable was the social side of meeting each other and sparking off each other. And some of them started working together. And so that's why I founded the Facebook group. It was to tell people about the meetups, but really the group <laughs> very quickly became more of a thing mm. than the meetups. But I think things have changed somewhat because now podcasting is flourishing. And I still think the community aspect is really quite lovely because the people who do it <laughs> are working very hard on something that can be quite solitary. And uh, I have a lot of respect for people doing these things, uh, often for no real reward. They, but they're motivated to, to to do creative work, um, and I think that's admirable. But there are also a lot of people who are getting into podcasting with quite, uh, kind of, I'm trying to think of the word, mercenary, I don't know, aspirations, where they just, it, they just want to do it for money or glory. And so often they'll meet me and they think by meeting me, I'm going to leapfrog them to money and glory without them having to do any work, <laughs> which I couldn't do even if I wanted to. But, you know, I, I really want to help people who just need like some, some, someone to look out for them because they are working so hard. But I, I don't really feel the need to help people who don't actually want to make a podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, they just want, they just want the effects. So I find that a bit dispiriting when they, they just, uh, you, uh, it's like when you know you're at a thing and they're looking over your shoulder to see if anyone more important than yeah. you is there um and i do not have to be the most important person in the room so like, i'm still very up for helping people insofar as i can but i can't i can't do the work for people because i don't have the capacity yeah. i mean i think that just you know knowing that someone else especially someone who is fairly established is still going through many of the same sort of struggles and complications and and you know difficulties mm. just knowing that that you're not alone in that i think that is an extremely valuable thing certainly you know i'm also a visual artist so knowing for example that uh, you know i might read a, a photographer's uh memoirs or something and knowing that say this really famous photographer who is very well established in her career perhaps even considered a legend is still having the same sort of doubts and and struggles with her work as I'm having with mine. I mean, the, I've, I've always found that very buoying, you know? Yes. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just, you can struggle with creative work for your entire life. It's certainly easier for me because I spent so many years just really panicking about just how to pay my rent and how to be able to afford to get a bus across London and not having to worry about those things because my podcasts are earning money is hugely freeing up a lot of my brain to do other things with, which is, which uh, has, has been majorly important. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, I don't know what people expect really. I think being in a good situation with my podcast, cause I'm very, very lucky in the situation that I have makes me work harder because I don't want to feel like I don't deserve it. Because there are a lot of people who deserve things that they never get, and I've got this thing that is wonderful. So I, I and, and I may never get such an opportunity again. So I, I don't want to biff that opportunity. Yeah. Well, why don't we take a little break and then we can come back and do the second segment? Lovely. So for the second segment, I always invite the guests to bring a topic of their own, which could be whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever happens to be on your mind. So what would you like to talk about today? Well, Mike. Recently, I've been spending quite a lot of time thinking about and looking at on the internet, visible mending techniques. Ah. So you've got holes in your garments and you can patch them, but you can also patch them with 
amazing zigzags of stitching or, or these sort of beautiful geometric shapes. And as someone who likes sewing and has made, I make quite a lot of my clothes, but I not very good at it. So they tend to fall apart quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think I really need to get into this to repair a lot of the deficiencies of garments, which are my own fault. And also just so things last longer and don't have to buy things because uh, I hate going shopping. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um yeah there is something uh especially there's um i've you know we'll see these series of videos where people are um doing these incredible stitching and then just sort of pulling it all together in one motion it's one of the most soothing uh mind-blowing kind of things i, I can oh, remember very seeing soothing. yeah um, and even oh, i'm staying at a friend's house in san francisco and um and he's like, oh, yeah, I just got into that a few weeks ago. And, and he's uh, just off on a camping trip for 10 days. And he's just taking this big pile of mending with him <laughs> as his <laughs> vacation entertainment. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. There's this interesting sort of phenomenon that I've been sort of seeing lately where I feel like a lot of people, especially older people, sort of tend to look around at the world and say like every, everything is electronic these days everything is digital nobody can do things anymore and especially these are uh sort of leveled at the younger generations hmm. but i i feel like these sort of craft type things have seen a resurgence in the last maybe 10 years or so that i mean it really wasn't the case that people were doing this in the 80s and 90s you know or at least I didn't see it as much. I don't know about you. I suppose in the well, in Britain maybe different to America, but I think in the nineties was when more affordable clothing became a lot more common. Mm. I think there were there was some kind of subsidy or, or tax reduction, so suddenly you had a lot more options and people started buying more. And then in the early part of this century in Britain, we got a lot of very, very, very cheap clothing. So it'd be like under ten dollars for a garment, and often a pretty well-made garment. Frighteningly uh, made by people in the horrible conditions, because there's always a consequence. And I think those habits of and that kind of retail is proving itself unsustainable uh, environmentally and in the human impact of making this stuff. But uh, it's a hard habit to break. I think for a lot of people just that you can buy things. I suppose capitalism as well requires us to buy things and have it in our minds that we are discontent, but we can fix that with buying things. Mm -hmm. So I like that there's a bit of a movement to get around that and instead repurpose things. And it's not the first time. I remember people upcycling garments years ago and things like that, but mending's not very glamorous. Uh, it's something that I grew up with my, my mum, um, she's a sewer and, um, my dad, uh, has garments that, uh, he's, he's got underpants that are older than I am. <laughs> 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 uh, and, um, he's got a lot of, uh, garments that you know, he, other people may have allowed to retire, but thanks to my mother, he's, he's managed to keep going because he's, he's not able to darn his own things or, or sew patches on things so she's very kindly done that for him and um it's kind of remarkable in a way you think yeah why not they they don't they don't look out of date particularly because a lot of styles actually don't change that rapidly so why not if he's going to achieve zero satisfaction from having a new thing because that's not really what he's interested in mm. I mean, I think that it's sort of this, this whole trend about visible mending. I, uh, there's two things about it. One is this sort of, uh, you know, sort of a, a counterbalance against this sort of disposability mentality that we all have these days, or at least in, um, sort of, I don't know if we still call it, call it first world countries, but you know, that kind of thing. But also, you know, that there's this, uh, opportunity for creativity and for personal expression in these things. And yeah. I, I feel like people, um, especially younger people, but you know, I think everybody these days is sort of having this, you know, that there's this need to be able to do both of those things to be able to one, find a more sustainable way of living, but two, to be more of an individual and to, to be able to find an outlet for expression. And the different ways that people are doing that, I, I, all the different ways, I find it really fascinating. 
Yeah. I think uh, if, if you're after something that is unique, then the flaws in it are probably unique. They might not always be that pleasant or beautifiable. But I think also it's tied into a change in perception in what acceptable dress should be and what power dressing should be. I think those kinds of standards have altered a lot in, in certain industries, like you know Steve Jobs wearing the Steve Jobs outfit rather than a power suit. Mm-hmm. Because obviously there's a lot of industries where there are set ways in which you must dress. But I think the more that these ideas that certain things have to be maintained and therefore you have to have money to look like that. I I love that those ideas might be uh, dwindling or at least not supported. Yeah. I think that there is sort of an interesting, you know, when I think of somebody like Steve Jobs and, you know, the sort of Silicon Valley tech industry in general, um, you know, the, the language there is always around disruption and mm. there are so many ways that we've seen how tech disruption has just been terrible for both the environment, for the economy, for people to be able to afford homes in San Francisco. Yeah. And what, what I'm thinking about here, you know, when you talk about these different uh, modes of dress, perhaps changing in business environments or things like that, I do think that there is sort of an interesting phenomenon of, uh, I don't know, it might be disruption in a different way happening with people and especially younger people finding a lot of interest in either new ways of being or in returning to more traditional ways of being. I I find that really fascinating. I think this phenomenon of mending seems related to that to me, you know? Yeah. And to me, traditional is often not a good thing to return to Uh, (laughs) because I think often it can be a way of, uh, you know, just reiterating (laughs) societal failures and inequality by being like, but look, it's historic. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I think that disruptive is a term that uh, I have uh, not much fondness for because it's a bit like there's a lot of privileged cis white guys in the tech industry and to me disruptive is a bit like oh look i've come and kicked your doll's house over well done me look i've made change but i haven't done anything to kind of put it back or to replace it with something better (laughs) um so i think constructive is preferable than disruptive Mm -hmm. yeah i mean and that that, uh, you know whole constructive whether you're constructing something new or perhaps repairing that seems relevant. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So maybe it is uh, disrupting certain paradigms of appearance, but it's also just a practical thing of making things last longer because people throw away a lot of very functional clothing. And, and I can have a friend who'll throw away a shirt when a button falls off. And yeah. sewing a button on is really easy and <laughs> takes about two minutes and takes extremely minimal low cost equipment. Yeah. They even and give you the buttons with the new shirt. They give you the buttons. Sometimes they even give you the thread. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, but I think also just a lot of people weren't taught to do that. And, uh, I don't think it is a female obligation to do that, but I certainly learned from my mother and my grandmother how to do sewing and repairs and stuff. And if there's kind of break in that, generational knowledge transmission maybe you get people who don't know that you can sew a button on very easily although now you could look on youtube or something yeah. you could look it up or wiki how <laughs> um but it's so much easier when someone tells you that something is possible and shows you like oh okay that is something i could do than yeah. having to prove to yourself that you could do it i think the thing is that sewing was considered girls work and yet Clothes are things everyone wears, so it'd be really useful if everyone was taught basic garment uh, repair and maintenance at some point. It really wouldn't take very long. Yeah. Here's how you sew a button on, here's how you patch a hole. Yeah. That's funny. Now go out and play. kind of place that I, I mean, I did learn some. My grandmother was a seamstress, and I I learned some from her. I actually learned a lot of it in Boy Scouts, too. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um do you get a special badge for, for sewing? No, they just taught you how to sew the badge on. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you need, kids. Yeah. I do think it's really interesting, you know, when you talk about knowledge transmission, uh, you know, from time to time I will see, you know, perhaps some baby boomer making fun of, uh, you know, YouTube how-to videos uh, 
you know, oh, the kids are learning everything on YouTube. Well, like, you know, this is something, why, why do these kids need to, um, even be taught this kind of thing? Like everybody just knows how to do this, right? Everybody should know how to do this. But, but the, the truth is that a lot of people weren't taught these things and that's why there need to be these videos. <laughs> Right, boomers, you didn't teach your Gen X children to do it. Now they're not teaching your uh, Gen Z grandchildren. Right. But also people forget, or, you, you know, your priorities are different. But a lot of things changed when it wasn't expected that a family would have a mother who was a domestic servant who was all-encompassing. And I'm definitely not <laughs> encouraging a return to that idea. Oh, yeah. Sure. But I guess nothing necessarily replaced it in terms of buttons. <laughs> yeah. Until YouTube, until anti YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's one question that I like to end with, and that is if there is a piece of art or literature or creativity in some form that you've experienced recently that meant something to you. Oh, that's a great question. And I'm trying to think, I feel like I should look at my book spreadsheet uh, a few years ago. Uh, I started keeping a, a spreadsheet of all the books I read to try and remember what yeah. books I've read. When I um, was a senior in high school, you know, the last day of class in my last year of high school, my English teacher um, showed us this little notebook that he'd been keeping for who knows how many decades. Um, and he just recommended we keep a reading journal. You don't have to make it complicated or anything like that. Just, you know, what were you reading and when? I didn't start doing that until maybe five or 10 years after high school, but it's been really valuable. Yeah. And it's so weird because I look at it and I think, oh, I don't remember anything about that book. I'm looking at one from six months ago that I remember absolutely nothing about, <laughs> um, even though I probably liked it. And other things where I was like, well, was that really this year? So looking at the books project, there's been quite a lot of good stuff, but I read, I, I read uh, both of Celeste Eng's novels at the end of last year. And I really loved both of those. Oh, I love her. Um, She's exceptional. Yeah. The first time I read her books was, I think I was 36 at the time. Uh, and that was the first time I'd ever read certain experiences as an Asian American uh, in a book before. Right. And I yeah. was very ha lucky to get the chance to tell her that on the show. I was very <laughs> happy to get to talk to her. That is, uh, yeah, that's a dream. Is she a dream? I'll probably never get to speak to her, but uh, <laughs> she's such delight. a lovely person. Yeah, she's really nice. Yeah, even as um, not not an Asian American, but just as uh, the child of an immigrant, I recognized certain tropes in there. Yeah. Well, um, so thank you so much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mike. Okay, so do be sure to check out all of Helen's podcasts, The Allusionist, Answer Me This, and Veronica Mars Investigations, which you can find everywhere podcasts can be found. And check out theallusionist.org slash events to find all of Helen's upcoming live events. She's just about to kick off her new Allusionist live show, No Title, which will be in London, Boston, D.C., Durham, North Carolina, Dallas, Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Portland, Oregon, L.A., and very possibly even more cities yet to be announced. You can find links to all of that in the show notes. And that is our show. You can find me and the show on Twitter and Instagram at Channel Open Pod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Keep the Channel Open, and you can reach me via email at podcast at Keep the Channel Open.com. Sign up for the KTCO newsletter by going to Keep the Channel Open.com slash connect, and every other week you'll get updates about the show as well as a curated list of poems, essays, art, and more from around the web. And if you'd like to support the show, you can make a pledge to our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash likewise media. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. We'll be back soon with a new episode, so stay tuned for that. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. Uh -oh.